Howdy, Manish Shah. I am an associate professor of pediatric neurosurgery, and I'm going to give you guys a talk on an update on pediatric epilepsy surgery. So this is a little bit about me. Um, I always put up this picture of my good friend, Mac Reeves. He's chief of plastic surgery here, and this is us when we started. Um, and uh, you know, we've had a wonderful opportunities to build out a lot of programs. He won't be giving a talk this year. Another reason I have his photo up but um, you're gonna hear from a lot of really wonderful people. So uh, I, I'm not from Texas, I got here as fast as I could, and that's kind of what you see up here. And it's been a real privilege to be here uh, for the last seven years. So financial disclosures, um, I have a laboratory in optical imaging that's funded uh, through the NIH. So a little overview of my talk. I really want to focus on the excellence of the pediatric epilepsy team um, and how we can solve very, very complicated problems. That's a big part of the update. So what's the rationale behind why we do everything? Uh, what are the tools in our toolbox and when do we use them uh, for, what, um, for what problem? And then, of course, our contact info. We are here to help you, so thank you so much for being here with us. So our pediatric epilepsy team, these are epileptologists. They're absolutely spectacular. They're the best epileptologists I've ever worked with. Um, they can solve very, very complicated problems. Um, and today we are going to focus on non-lesional epilepsy, which is the most challenging thing in pediatric epilepsy. And our center has a spectacular quantity of experience with it. So just off the bat, the numbers in pediatric epilepsy are devastating. There are three million Americans with epilepsy, and a third of those have drug-resistant epilepsy. That's a million people walking around with drug-resistant epilepsy and all of its associated morbidities. So how does that pan out numbers-wise? 150,000 children are born every year with epilepsy, and that is 50,000 new drug-resistant cases. And drug resistance means they failed two or more medications. Um, and what it, that ends up coming out as is that it takes 17 to 20 years on average for a child who's diagnosed with drug resistant epilepsy to then get treatment. They're not children anymore. They're adults. Um, they're never going to get the chance to be fully independent. Uh, they're they're going to have had this entire life of have, having seizures. They never got the chance to really develop their brain correctly um, without just constant epileptogenic activity. And so there's a huge need to close this gap. And that burden really falls on the caregivers and the, the primary providers. If you have a patient who is still having seizures and they're, they're on two medications, um, you need to refer them for phase one evaluation. A phase one evaluation is video EG and MRI and MEG at the center. It, it's not surgery. It's to evaluate somebody for surgery. It's very, very critical. Um, and that's the only way we're gonna close this gap and really, really make a dent in pediatric epilepsy. So what kind of tools do we have at UT and Herman? We have video EG, we have high resolution three Tesla MRI, we have targeted neuropsychological testing, and then we have all the bells and whistles for advanced imaging modalities. But specifically, we are world experts, international experts in magnetoencephalography with Dr. Michael Funke and um, our research uh, professor, Professor John Mosher. Um, we really have a lot of expertise in, in this very sophisticated technology. Um, that's phase one. And then in terms of invasive phase two pre-resection uh, tools, stereo EG is something that we have really pioneered in children. Um, we're the first uh, in, in the state and the region to have uh, ROSA robot, and um, it's, it's been a really wonderful program. And we are now the first in the state to have a much smaller uh, Medtronic stealth auto guide robot that we'll talk about a little bit later. So what's the goal of such an evaluation? It's to figure out if they're a good candidate for resection. Um, so if we can lateralize the epileptogenic zone, i.e. put it on one side of the head or localize it even further, that's great. Um, and then we need to figure out if there are any very critical parts of the brain in and around this epileptogenic zone and will the child have a deficit um, if we're going to offer some kind of surgery. So sometimes we need to do invasive monitoring. Um, almost always now we do that with SEG. The electrodes are only 0.8 millimeters, very, very small surgery overall. And you know, the children do really well from this. And we're actually able to map language now with it. It's a really great, great tool for monitoring. 
Um, the goal is resection, when we get to that, phase three, are to drastically reduce the seizure burden. The goal is always seizure freedom, but a drastic reduction in seizure burden is huge for brain development. So why is that? It's because epilepsy is a disorder of brain networks. So this is a PNS paper that uh, I put out 10 years ago now. And this is us performing a calcitomy on a patient who had epileptogenic, uh, ep uh, epileptic encephalopathy. And so constantly seizing, uh, the brain networks are very disordered. And, and so before calcitomy, this is an anterior two-thirds calcitomy, you see on the left, there's just very, very poor rhythm. Um, and there's just constant seizures in all, all the electrodes. After calcitomy, there's a substantial improvement in, in the rhythm. And then in terms of development, it was very similar. The child actually regressed. And then after the calcitomy, you start to regain milestones. And what you see here, are us picking different seed regions of brain motor networks, uh, resting state networks in the brain. So the motor region, um, the uh, visual cortex, um, and then uh, auditory cortex and, and locations like that. Before calcitomy, it was very, very hard to see any kind of um, brain network order at all. But after, after the surgery, you can start to see that there's a motor network. This is the motor strip. Um, this is the default mode network that we see here. This is uh, uh, the visual cortex that we're, that we're seeing over here. Um, and so things have really improved for this patient. So again, there's much, much more structure on the right after surgery that you can, you can take from these covariance matrices and you can build out these networks much more easily than before surgery. So epilepsy really alters and harms the developing brain. And that's what you should get out of this. And it's a very, very important to treat it as soon as you can. If you go from four seizures to two seizures um, a day on medications, you may consider that a victory, but it isn't because these brain networks aren't developing correctly in the child. So we have a lot of different surgical treatments from vagus nerve stimulation all the way up to hemispherotomy. Um, and we tailor these to, the appropriate, to do the appropriate surgery for the appropriate patient. And we are really experts in invasive monitoring um, to help lead to very, very minimal uh, brain sparing resections or laser ablations. So today we're gonna focus this update on non-lesional epilepsy. What is non-lesional epilepsy? Of course there's a lesion, it's just that we can't see it on the MRI technology that we have. So as a result, there's no easy test to find this. There's not even an MRI to show. When we look at the MRI, there's nothing to see. Um, the human eye can't find it, and even more sophisticated computer algorithms can't really find it, just off the structural MRI. So this is, this is the kind of patient that really, really needs referral as soon as possible. When a child is having seizures, despite medications, you might get an MRI report that says there, there's nothing in, going on lesion-wise in the brain, but it's a problem. This patient probably has a, a lesion, so we call that surgical lesion positive, um, and will respond to treatment. And so our group has a lot of experience in finding the spot that's causing the problem or the spots that are causing the problem. And it's a combination of the advanced imaging um, and technologies that we have, uh, like MEG, that magnetoencephalography I was talking about, and then also SEG, where we can invasively monitor with you know, electrodes that are about the size of your hair, 0.8 millimeters. But really, the big part of it is the thinking part. And so this is a, just, just an example patient. Um, it's a 13-year-old girl. She's been seizing for a long time, um, over 10 years. And her semiology, this is a very important part of the thinking, so she has behavioral arrest, which is telling us it's somewhere in the frontal lobe, followed by automatisms, followed by a, a version of, of the head to the right, which is kind of telling us it's happening in the left frontal lobe, which then pro pro progresses on to a generalized tonic-clonic seizure. And so our EMU stay shows spikes in the frontal side, um, and then uh, the EG is kind of lateralizing, it's on the left side, but the MRI is non-lesional. So with all the other testing and the modalities in the MEG, which is extremely helpful, the, uh, we can have two hypotheses where we think the seizures are coming from, either the frontal area on the left or the temporal area on the left. So when we have these hypotheses, we have to test them. So we have a lot of uh, different modalities, things like MEG, we have PET, um, we have ICTL-SPECT, which is a single photon emission computed tomography. 
um, where we give a radionuclide um, within a certain window uh, after the child has started to seize and then we get them down to the scanner um, as opposed to interictal PET which is between seizures where we look for hypometabolism and then I think seven Tesla MRI one day is going to be important in this to help you know what, what we can't see in a three Tesla MRI maybe we'll see on seven Tesla. So anyway after all this since there was nothing on the MRI, we, we investigate our, our hypotheses. So you see us concentrating electrodes in the frontal and the temporal area. Um, and this actually is a specialty that we do here. It's a longitudinal temporal electrode where we can map language. Um, and we're able to find it. So uh, th this pattern is what you're seeing. You're seeing uh, the start and then the spread. We've grouped the electrodes so that you can see that, um, but but anyway, this is this is a great sign of success. Uh, so we can then map where we think the seizure is propagating from in space, and this is really the the advantage of going to a center where we can think three dimensionally in space um, with these electrodes that have been planted, test our hypotheses, and then figure out where this lesion is that we can't see. So so to summarize, then we found the onset in this electrode at two and three. And we did that using this tiny little robot that we were very proud to be one of the first to have um, and use uh, and have expertise in, which is called the Stealth Autoguide Robot. Um, you know, the, this is the patient's arm, this is the patient, this is the robot, it's, it's very, very small. Um, and we're pioneers in using it. And it's rare that we, that we aren't gonna use SEG um, but there are sometimes um, when the child is too small or a uh, neurologist um, is not comfortable with SEG. And again, we are very thankful that we have a spectacular neurologist. Uh, we don't use it. And then if there's only one hypothesis, so let's say it was only a frontal hypothesis, we would go straight to resection or laser ablation. Here we did a laser ablation. Um, and the child has been seizure-free for the last year after 10 years of seizing, which is really spectacular. So, so that's my update. Um, who, who, is the, who is the most important person um, in, in all this? It's you. It's you who are going to refer the patient to us uh, for us to be able to evaluate them if they've been seizing on two medications. Very critical for them to get a, a shot at having a substantial reduction in their seizure burden while their brains can still develop. Um, and that's very, very important. So a lot of people to thank uh, William Radcliffe, uh, Hilary Katulak, Ann Crocker, Elise Pratt, our UT Health and Neurosciences marketing team, our clinic staff, our extraordinary neurologists who you're gonna, you're gonna get to hear from a lot of them, um, our EMU staff and EEG techs, my partners who you're going to hear a talk from, um, one of our adult partners, uh, Nathan Tandon, um, and specifically, I'd like to highlight Brandon Miller as our wonderful new recruit here um, and uh, co-pediatric epilepsy surgeon who you'll get to meet over time. So thank you all for your time.